This is a recast of the 11,500 word piece. Hypothesis testing Z-test, T-test, and ANOVA explained from Schnippat AI. Let's listen in. Today we're diving into the topic of hypothesis testing, a fundamental aspect of statistical analysis. Hypothesis testing allows researchers to test assumptions or claims known as hypotheses using observed data. The main goal is to evaluate whether the data provides sufficient evidence to support a specific hypothesis or whether the hypothesis should be rejected. Hypothesis testing is a structured framework that helps us determine the likelihood that a given hypothesis is true, considering the randomness and variability in data. This process is critical for making informed decisions, especially when we have incomplete or imperfect information. The ability to quantify uncertainty and make probabilistic statements about hypotheses makes hypothesis testing a powerful tool in research and applied settings. Hypothesis testing plays a pivotal role in decision-making across various disciplines, such as medicine, biology, economics, and social sciences. In scientific research, it forms the backbone of experimental design and data analysis. Researchers use hypothesis testing to validate or refute theories, assess the effectiveness of interventions, and explore relationships between variables. In decision-making, hypothesis testing helps stakeholders evaluate potential outcomes and make choices under uncertainty. For example, businesses might use hypothesis testing to determine if a new marketing strategy significantly increases sales compared to the existing approach. In medicine, clinicians rely on hypothesis tests to assess whether a new treatment is more effective than a standard one, guiding important clinical decisions that impact patient care. The formal nature of hypothesis testing, combined with its ability to control for random variation, ensures that decisions and conclusions drawn from data are statistically valid and scientifically sound. This aspect is crucial for advancing knowledge, driving innovation, and making evidence-based decisions in various fields. The article we're discussing today has a specific objective, to provide a comprehensive understanding of hypothesis testing by focusing on three key statistical tests, the Z-test, T-test, and analysis of variance, ANOVA. These tests have their own assumptions, mathematical formulations, and use cases. By exploring these tests in depth, the article aims to elucidate their theoretical foundations, practical applications, and significance in statistical analysis. The scope of the essay includes introducing fundamental concepts and principles underlying hypothesis testing, analyzing the Z-test, T-test, and ANOVA, exploring their historical context and evolution within statistical theory, discussing challenges and limitations of hypothesis testing, and touching on advanced topics and emerging trends in the field. The historical background of hypothesis testing is also explored in the article. The origins of hypothesis testing can be traced back to early developments in probability and statistics. Mathematicians and statisticians like Pierre-Simon Laplace and Carl Friedrich Gauss made significant contributions in this field. The development of probability theory in the 18th and 19th centuries provided tools for quantifying uncertainty and making inferences from data. Ronald A. Fisher, Jersey Neiman, and Egon Pearson played key roles in formalizing hypothesis testing as a statistical method. Fisher introduced significance testing, which involves testing the null hypothesis and using p-values to determine the strength of evidence against it. Neiman and Pearson developed a framework that emphasized controlling error rates and introduced concepts like type I and type II errors. Their contributions laid the foundation for the hypothesis testing methods widely used today. The development of specific hypothesis tests like the Z-test, T-test, and ANOVA was driven by the need to address different types of statistical questions. The Z-test is used when the sample size is large and the population variance is known. It leverages the properties of the normal distribution. The T-test was introduced by William Seeley Gossett under the name student to handle situations where the sample size is small and the population variance is unknown. It uses students in distribution. ANOVA, developed by Ronald Fisher, allows for comparing means across multiple groups. Hypothesis testing has had a profound influence on statistical methods and practices. Its introduction marked a significant shift in how researchers approached data analysis, emphasizing formal decision-making processes based on empirical evidence. Fields like medicine, agriculture, psychology, and economics benefited from the rigorous application of hypothesis testing through controlled experiments and observational studies. Hypothesis testing continues to evolve, 
Ongoing research addresses its limitations and expands its applications. Non-parametric tests, Bayesian hypothesis testing, and modern machine learning methods are all extensions of the fundamental principles that underlie hypothesis testing. To summarize, hypothesis testing is a cornerstone of statistical analysis deeply embedded in the history and practice of modern science. Its development has paved the way for a more rigorous and evidence-based approach to research. In this article, we're going to focus on some key concepts in hypothesis testing, including type 2 error, test statistics, p-values, critical regions, sampling distributions, the central limit theorem, sample size, and formulating hypotheses. Let's start with type 2 error. This occurs when the null hypothesis is not rejected when it is actually false. It's also known as a false negative or a beta error. The probability of making a type 2 error is denoted by beta b. On the other hand, the power of the test, 1 minus beta, represents the probability of correctly rejecting a false null hypothesis. So higher power indicates a higher likelihood of detecting an effect when one exists. Now, let's move on to test statistics, p-values, and critical regions. A test statistic is a standardized value calculated from the sample data that helps us make a decision about the null hypothesis. The choice of test statistic depends on the type of data in the hypothesis being tested. Common test statistics include the Z-statistic, T-statistic, and F-statistic, each corresponding to different types of hypothesis tests. Once we have the test statistic, we compare it against a theoretical distribution, such as the normal distribution or to distribution, to determine the p-value or identify whether the test statistic falls within a critical region. The p-value represents the probability of obtaining a test statistic as extreme as, or more extreme than, the observed value under the assumption that the null hypothesis is true. A small p-value, typically less than the significance level, indicates strong evidence against the null hypothesis and leads to its rejection. Conversely, a large p-value suggests that the observed data is consistent with the null hypothesis. Speaking of critical regions, they are the set of values for the test statistic that lead to the rejection of the null hypothesis. The critical region is determined by the significance level. For a one-tailed test, the critical region lies in one tail of the distribution, while for a two-tailed test, it is split between the two tails. Moving on, let's talk about sampling distributions and the central limit theorem, CLT. A sampling distribution is the probability distribution of a given statistic based on a random sample. It's critical in hypothesis testing because it helps us determine the probability of observing a particular test statistic under the null hypothesis. It's important to note that there is a trade-off between type I errors, false positives, and type II errors, false negatives. Adjusting the significance level affects this trade-off. Lowering the significance level reduces the likelihood of making a type I error, but also decreases power, while increasing power reduces the chance of making a type II error, but increases the risk of a type I error. Finally, article also mentions the multiple comparisons problem, which arises when a study involves multiple hypothesis tests. Each individual test carries a risk of error, and as the number of tests increases, so does the cumulative probability of incorrectly rejecting a true null hypothesis. This poses a challenge in studies involving multiple comparisons. So in conclusion, ANOVA is a versatile and widely used statistical method that allows researchers to compare means across multiple groups and factors. By understanding its assumptions, applications, and extensions, researchers can effectively use ANOVA to uncover significant differences in their data and make informed decisions in various fields. To address the multiple comparisons problem, researchers use methods to control the family-wise error rate, FWER, which is the probability of making one or more type I errors across a set of hypothesis tests. These methods are widely used in fields such as genomics, psychology, and social sciences, where multiple comparisons are common, ensuring that the risk of false positives is kept under control. One common method to control the FWER is the Bonferroni correction. This method adjusts the significance level for each individual test to account for the number of comparisons being made. The adjusted significance level is calculated as a MEM, where MEM is the number of tests. While this method effectively controls the FWER, it can be overly conservative, leading to a higher likelihood of type 2 errors. Another method to control the FWER is Holmes' method, 
Holmes' method is a sequentially rejective procedure that is less conservative than the Bonferroni correction. The p-values are ranked from smallest to largest, and each p-value is compared to an adjusted significance level that becomes less stringent as more tests are conducted. This method provides a balance between controlling the FWER and maintaining statistical power. Now let's talk about the false discovery rate, FDR, and its application in large-scale testing. The FDR is another approach to managing the multiple comparisons problem, particularly useful in scenarios such as genomics or high-throughput screening. Unlike FWER methods, which aim to minimize any type by error, FDR controls the expected proportion of false positives among the rejected hypotheses. FDR methods are particularly important in fields where the sheer volume of tests makes traditional FWER corrections impractical, allowing researchers to make more discoveries without a prohibitive risk of false positives. One widely used method for controlling the FDR is the benjamini hochberg BH procedure. It ranks p-values and applies a less stringent threshold for significance as the number of tests increases. This approach allows for greater power in detecting true effects while controlling the rate of false discoveries. Moving on to non-parametric alternatives, these are statistical tests that do not assume a specific distribution for the data. They are useful when the assumptions of parametric tests, such as normality or homogeneity of variances, are violated. Non-parametric methods are particularly advantageous in situations involving small sample sizes, skewed distributions, or ordinal data. That's correct. Non-parametric tests are often used when the data is not normally distributed and transformations fail to normalize it. They are also used when the sample size is too small to reliably assess the normality of the data or when the data is ordinal or ranked rather than interval or ratio. Some common non-parametric tests serve as alternatives to their parametric counterparts. The Wilcoxon rank sum test is used to compare the medians of two independent samples when the data does not meet the assumptions of normality. The Mann-Whitney U test is essentially equivalent to the Wilcoxon rank sum test and compares the ranks of two independent samples to assess whether they come from the same distribution. And finally, the Kruskal-Wallis test is the non-parametric equivalent of one-way ANOVA and is used to compare medians across three or more independent groups when normality and homogeneity of variances assumptions are violated. Now let's discuss the advantages and limitations of non-parametric approaches. One advantage is that non-parametric tests do not require specific distribution assumptions for the data, making them more flexible and robust in real-world scenarios. They are also more appropriate for small sample sizes where parametric tests might be unreliable. Additionally, non-parametric tests can analyze ordinal data, which parametric tests typically cannot handle. However, non-parametric tests generally have less statistical power compared to parametric tests, especially when the data meets the assumptions of parametric tests. The results of non-parametric tests are also typically less intuitive to interpret than parametric tests, since they rely on ranks rather than raw data. Finally, non-parametric tests may lose some information contained in the data by focusing on ranks rather than actual values, potentially reducing the precision of the analysis. Now, let's move on to Bayesian hypothesis testing. Bayesian approaches offer an alternative to frequentist methods by incorporating prior knowledge or beliefs into the analysis. In Bayesian statistics, probabilities are treated as degrees of belief rather than long-run frequencies, allowing for a more flexible and subjective interpretation of uncertainty. In Bayesian hypothesis testing, the likelihood of the data given a hypothesis is combined with a prior distribution representing prior beliefs about the parameters to produce a posterior distribution. This posterior distribution reflects updated beliefs after considering observed data. Bayesian methods are particularly useful in situations where prior information is available or when the data is limited or uncertain. One key metric in Bayesian hypothesis testing is the Bayes factor, which is used to compare evidence provided by data for two competing hypotheses. The Bayes factor is calculated as the ratio of the likelihood of the data under one hypothesis to the likelihood of the data under another hypothesis. The strength of evidence can be interpreted using guidelines, with higher Bayes factors indicating stronger evidence in favor of one hypothesis over another. If the Bayes factor is greater than one, it means that there is more support for one hypothesis compared to another.
If it's less than 1, there's more support for another hypothesis. And if it's equal to 1, there's equal support for both hypotheses. Finally, let's compare Bayesian and Frequentist hypothesis testing approaches. The Frequentist approach focuses on long run frequencies of events and uses p-values to make decisions about hypotheses. It does not incorporate prior information and treats parameters as fixed but unknown quantities. On the other hand, Bayesian approaches incorporate prior information through prior distributions and update these beliefs with new data to form posterior distributions. Bayesian methods provide a probabilistic interpretation of hypotheses and allow for direct statements about the probability of a hypothesis being true. While Bayesian methods offer a more flexible and intuitive approach to inference, they can be computationally intensive, especially in complex models or large datasets. The choice of prior distribution can also influence results and introduce subjectivity into the analysis. In summary, both approaches have their advantages and limitations depending on the context and research question. It's important to carefully consider which approach is most appropriate for your specific analysis. The article we're discussing today focuses on the selection of the appropriate hypothesis test based on the characteristics of the data. It starts off by categorizing different types of data and suggesting suitable tests for each category. The article mentions three types of data, continuous data, categorical data, and ordinal data. For continuous data, tests like the Z-test, T-test, or ANOVA are recommended. Categorical data can be analyzed using chi-square tests or Fisher's exact test. And for ordinal data, non-parametric tests like the mann whitney test or kruskal wallace test are appropriate. The number of groups being compared is another important factor in test selection. If there are only two groups, a t-test, either independent or paired, or a non-parametric equivalent can be used. But if there are three or more groups, ANOVA or its non-parametric equivalent, the Kruskal-Wallis test should be considered. Sample size also plays a role in determining the appropriate test. For small sample sizes, less than 30, t-tests or non-parametric tests are generally more suitable. But for large sample sizes, 30 or more, Z-tests or parametric tests like ANOVA are often used. The distribution of the data is another factor to consider. If the data follows a normal distribution, parametric tests like the Z-test, T-test, or ANOVA can be used. But if the data does not follow a normal distribution, non-parametric tests should be considered. When it comes to variance, if the variances are equal, standard versions of T-tests and ANOVA can be used. But if the variances are unequal, Welch's t-test or a modified ANOVA approach should be used. To simplify the decision-making process for test selection, flowcharts and decision trees can be extremely helpful. These tools lay out a clear path based on the characteristics of the data. The article provides an example decision tree that guides users through the selection process. The decision tree starts by asking if the data is continuous. It guess, it further asks about the number of groups being compared and whether the data is normally distributed. Based on the answers to these questions, it leads to the most appropriate test. The article also presents two case studies to demonstrate how the decision-making process for test selection is applied in real-world research. In the first case study, a clinical trial is conducted to compare the effectiveness of a new drug against a placebo using continuous data in two independent groups. In the second case study, an educator wants to compare student performance across three different teaching methods using percentage scores as the measure of performance. This involves continuous data and three groups being compared. These case studies show how each step in the decision-making process is applied to select the appropriate test based on the characteristics of the data. Moving on to common misconceptions and errors in hypothesis testing, one of the most common misconceptions is about p-values. A p-value represents the probability of obtaining the observed results or more extreme results assuming the null hypothesis is true. It does not measure the probability that the null hypothesis itself is true or false. Another common error is treating the significance level as an absolute threshold. The significance level is chosen arbitrarily and results just above or below this threshold should not be interpreted drastically differently. Researchers should consider the context and not solely rely on whether the p-value crosses this threshold. That's an important point to remember. A p-value of 0.05 does not mean there is a 95% chance that the results are not due to random chance. 
It simply indicates that if the null hypothesis were true, there would be a 5% chance of obtaining results as extreme as those observed. Another issue discussed in the article is over-reliance on hypothesis testing without considering effect size. Hypothesis testing determines statistical significance, but does not provide information about effect size, which measures the magnitude of the difference or relationship being tested. It's important to report both the p-value and effect size to provide a more complete picture of the results, including their practical significance. A statistically significant result may have a very small effect size, meaning that while it's unlikely due to chance, it may not be practically meaningful. Addressing the reproducibility crisis in scientific research is another important topic covered in the article. The reproducibility crisis refers to concerns that many scientific findings cannot be replicated by other researchers. Several factors contribute to this issue, including pay hacking, publication bias, and small sample sizes. To address these issues, solutions such as per registration, replication studies, open data sharing, and transparency are recommended. Finally, the article discusses statistical software and tools that can be used for hypothesis testing. Some widely used statistical software packages mentioned are R, Python, SPSS, and SAS. Each software package has its own strengths and user base. R is popular for its flexibility and extensive packages for hypothesis testing. Python is favored for its integration with machine learning and data science workflows. SPSS offers user-friendly interfaces for users with limited programming experience. And SAS is known for handling large data sets and complex statistical analyses. Each software allows for implementing standard tests like Z-tests, T-tests, and ANOVA using different functions or commands specific to that software. That covers all the main points from this article. We hope you found this discussion helpful in understanding how to select an appropriate hypothesis test based on your data characteristics. Stay tuned for more interesting topics in future episodes. Thanks for listening. Today we're talking about hypothesis testing and specifically three key statistical tests, the Z-test, T-test, and analysis of variance, ANOVA. These tests are commonly used in statistical analysis to make informed decisions based on sample data. It's important to understand the assumptions underlying these tests. Assumptions such as normality, independence, and homogeneity of variances play a crucial role in the validity of the results. Misapplying these tests or ignoring their assumptions can lead to incorrect conclusions. Let's start by discussing the Z-test. The Z-test is primarily used when the sample size is large and the population variance is known. It's effective for testing hypotheses about population means and proportions, especially when the central limit theorem ensures that the sampling distribution approximates normality. The Z-test is straightforward to apply, making it a powerful tool in fields where large datasets are common. On the other hand, we have the T-test, which is essential for situations where the sample size is small and the population variance is unknown. The t-test offers flexibility and precision when comparing means from two independent samples, paired samples, or a single sample against a known mean. It relies on that distribution to account for the additional uncertainty inherent in small samples. Finally, we have ANOVA. ANOVA extends hypothesis testing to scenarios involving three or more groups. By partitioning variants into between group and within group components, ANOVA determines whether any of the group means differ significantly from each other. ANOVA is indispensable in experimental research, where multiple treatments or conditions are compared. It provides a way to analyze and compare means across different groups effectively. Now let's talk about some future directions and challenges in hypothesis testing. One of the major challenges lies in dealing with big data. Traditional hypothesis testing methods may struggle to cope with the high dimensionality, heterogeneity, and sheer scale of modern datasets. That's where robust and adaptive methods come into play. Robust statistical methods that can handle outliers, non-normal distributions, and unequal variances are increasingly important. Additionally, adaptive methods that adjust the significance level or test statistics based on the data's characteristics are being developed to provide more accurate and reliable results. Another exciting trend is the integration of hypothesis testing with machine learning, ML. ML models primarily focus on prediction and pattern recognition, but combining them with hypothesis testing ensures that the patterns identified are statistically significant and not just artifacts of the data.
This integration can enhance the interpretability and trustworthiness of ML models, especially in fields like healthcare and finance, where decisions based on ML outputs have critical consequences. As we move forward into the era of big data and artificial intelligence, AI, hypothesis testing is evolving to meet new demands. The sheer volume of data allows for more granular analysis and the potential to detect subtle effects that were previously obscured. However, this also raises concerns about multiple comparisons and the risk of false positives. That's why more sophisticated methods for controlling error rates are being developed using AI and machine learning techniques. In conclusion, while the core principles of hypothesis testing remain foundational, the field is rapidly evolving to address the challenges posed by modern data. Researchers must continue to adapt their approaches, integrating new methods and technologies to ensure that hypothesis testing remains a vital tool for scientific inquiry and decision-making in the 21st century. Here comes the central limit theorem. The CLT is a fundamental theorem in statistics that states that regardless of the population's distribution, the distribution of sample means will approach a normal distribution as the sample size increases, provided that the sample size is sufficiently large. This theorem justifies the use of normal distribution-based test statistics, even when the underlying data is not normally distributed, as long as the sample size is large. Speaking of sample size, it plays a crucial role in the accuracy and reliability of hypothesis testing results. Larger sample sizes lead to more precise estimates of population parameters and reduce the standard error of the sample statistic, making the test more sensitive to detecting true effects. That's correct. And let's not forget about formulating hypotheses. This step is crucial in hypothesis testing as it directly influences our conclusions. The null hypothesis, A0, represents no effect or no difference between groups or variables being compared. The alternative hypothesis, A1 or H, represents what we're trying to prove or find evidence for. For different scenarios, hypotheses may take different forms. For example, when comparing means, we might have a null hypothesis stating that two population means are equal, mu1 equals mu2. While the alternative hypothesis suggests they are not equal, mu1 does not equal mu2. Similarly, when comparing proportions or testing variances, we formulate different null and alternative hypotheses based on our research question and data. Let's discuss one-tailed versus two-tailed tests. The choice between these depends on the direction of effect we expect to detect. A one-tailed test is used when we have a specific direction in mind for our alternative hypothesis. For example, if we believe that a new drug is more effective than an established treatment, our alternative hypothesis might be the mean improvement in patients treated with the new drug is greater than that in patients treated with standard treatment. On the other hand, a two-tailed test is used when we're interested in detecting any difference from the null hypothesis, regardless of direction. Now let's move on to practical examples to illustrate these concepts. For example, suppose a researcher wants to test whether a new diet plan leads to weight loss. The null hypothesis could be the average weight before starting the diet plan is equal to the average weight after following it, mu1 equals mu2. While the alternative hypothesis might be the average weight after following the diet plan is less than the average weight before starting it, mu1 is less than mu2. Another example could be studying two marketing strategies and comparing their success rates. The null hypothesis could state that the proportion of successful sales using strategy A is equal to that using strategy B, P1 equals P2. While the alternative hypothesis suggests a difference, the proportion of successful sales using strategy A is not equal to that using strategy B, P1 does not equal P2. Let's not forget about testing variances in quality control processes. The null hypothesis might assert that the variances of weights from two different production lines are equal, sigma1 squared equals sigma2 squared, while the alternative hypothesis would suggest they are different the variances of weights from two different production lines are not equal. Sigma 1 squared does not equal sigma 2 squared. Now that we've covered those practical examples, let's dive into z-tests. The z-test is a statistical hypothesis test used to determine whether there is a significant difference between a sample statistic and a population parameter or between two sample statistics under certain assumptions. Those assumptions include that either our sample data follows a normal distribution or our sample size is large enough for CLT to apply. 
Additionally, we assume that our population variance is known and that our samples are independent and measured at least on an interval or ratio scale. In situations where these assumptions are met, Z-tests provide a reliable method for testing hypotheses about population means, proportions, and differences between two population means. That's correct. Let's start by talking about the one-sample Z-test. This test is used to determine if the mean of a single sample differs significantly from a known population mean when the population variance is known. An example of this could be a company that produces light bulbs with an advertised lifespan of 1,000 hours. They take a sample of 50 light bulbs and test them, finding that the sample mean lifespan is 980 hours. They also know that the population standard deviation is 50 hours. In this case, they can use a one-sample z-test to determine if the observed difference in mean lifespan is statistically significant or if it could have occurred by random chance. Now let's move on to the two-sample z-test. This test is used to compare the means of two independent samples and determine if they come from populations with the same mean. This test is particularly useful when the population variances are known and the sample sizes are large. An example of this could be a researcher wanting to compare the average test scores of students from two different schools to determine if there is a significant difference in their performance. The null hypothesis in this case might be that the two populations have the same mean test score. To calculate the z-statistic for the two-sample z-test, we use the formula mentioned in the article. If the z-statistic falls within the critical region, or if the p-value is less than the significance level, we reject the null hypothesis and conclude that there is a significant difference between the two population means. That's correct. Now let's talk about the z-test for proportions. This test is used to compare population proportions or to test hypotheses about population proportions. An example of this could be a political analyst using a z-test for proportions to test whether the proportion of voters supporting a particular candidate in a sample matches the reported proportion from previous elections. For testing a single proportion, we use a formula to calculate the z-statistic. And for comparing two proportions, there is another formula mentioned in the article. If the z-statistic is sufficiently large, we reject the null hypothesis and conclude that there is a significant difference between the sample proportions and the hypothesized population proportions, or between two sample proportions. That's correct. Now let's talk about some real-world applications of the z-test in business, medicine, and social sciences. In business, a manufacturer may use a one-sample z-test to verify whether the average weight of products in a batch meets the specified standards. And a two-sample z-test might be used to compare the effectiveness of two marketing campaigns by analyzing the average sales generated by each. In medicine, a clinical trial might use a z-test to compare the average recovery times of patients treated with a new drug versus a play spell. This can help determine whether the observed difference in recovery times is statistically significant. In social sciences, researchers might use a z-test for proportions to assess the difference in voting patterns between two demographic groups. For example, they could test whether the proportion of voters supporting a particular policy differs significantly between urban and rural areas. Now, let's talk about interpreting the results of a z-test and its practical implications. Interpreting the results involves understanding both statistical and practical significance. A statistically significant result indicates that the observed difference is unlikely to be due to random chance. However, statistical significance does not always imply practical significance. For example, in business, a statistically significant difference in average sales might not be practically significant if it's too small to justify switching strategies. In medicine, a new treatment might show a statistically significant improvement in patient outcomes, but it must have a large enough effect size to be clinically meaningful. Researchers and decision makers need to consider both p-values and effect sizes when interpreting z-test results to ensure that their conclusions are both statistically valid and practically relevant. Now let's talk about some limitations and potential pitfalls in using the z-test. One limitation is that it assumes known variance, which is often unrealistic in practice. When the population variance is unknown, we generally prefer using the t-test instead. Another limitation is that the z-test relies heavily on sample size. With small sample sizes, inaccuracies can arise due to deviations from normality or violations of assumptions. Over-reliance on p-values is also a common pitfall. While the values provide information about statistical significance, they do not convey information about effect size or practical significance. 
Finally, if data does not meet assumptions of normality or independence, then Z test results may be invalid. It's important to assess whether this test is appropriate for your specific data set. Despite these limitations, the Z test remains a widely used and valuable tool in statistical hypothesis testing when its assumptions are met and its results are interpreted with caution. Now let's dive into the main points of the article. The article begins by explaining the mathematical formulation of the t-test statistic. The formula for calculating the t-test statistic takes into account the sample mean, hypothesized population mean, sample standard deviation, and sample size. It calculates the number of standard errors by which the sample mean differs from the hypothesized population mean, and this helps determine the p-value. The article then goes on to discuss the different types of t-tests. The first type is the one-sample t-test, which is used to test whether the mean of a single sample is significantly different from a known or hypothesized population mean. This type of t-test is particularly useful when the sample size is small and the population variance is unknown. Then we have the independent two-sample t-test, which is used to compare the means of two independent groups to determine if they are significantly different from each other. This type of t-test is particularly relevant when comparing the means of two different populations or groups. That's correct. And finally, we have the paired t-test, which is used to compare the means of two related groups, such as pre-test, post-test scenarios. This test takes into account that the observations in the two groups are not independent, but rather paired or matched in some way. Now let's move on to the applications of the t-test. The article mentions some common scenarios where t-tests are widely used. One example is in medical studies, where t-tests are commonly used in clinical trials to compare the effects of a new drug with a placebo. Another scenario where t-tests are commonly used is in educational assessments. Educators may use a one-sample t-test to determine whether the average test scores of a small class differ significantly from a national average or a benchmark score. Additionally, an independent two-sample t-test might be employed to compare the performance of students taught using two different instructional methods. Lastly, experimental research also makes use of t-tests. In experimental psychology or social sciences, researchers might use a paired t-test to analyze the impact of a specific intervention, such as comparing participants' attitudes before and after exposure to a particular stimulus. The t-test allows them to assess whether the observed changes are statistically significant. Now, let's move on to examples and case studies that illustrate how t-tests are applied in practice. The article provides three examples of medical study, an educational assessment, and experimental research. In the medical study example, a researcher conducts a study to determine whether a new drug significantly lowers cholesterol levels. A sample of 15 patients is selected, and their cholesterol levels are measured before and after taking the drug. The paired t-test is used to analyze the data. If the p-value calculated from the t-test is below the chosen significance level, the researcher would reject the null hypothesis and conclude that the drug has a significant effect on lowering cholesterol. In the educational assessment example, an educator wants to compare the effectiveness of two teaching methods on student performance. A sample of students is divided into two groups, each taught using a different method. After the course, an independent two-sample t-test is used to compare the mean test scores of the two groups. If the test results show a significant difference, the educator might conclude that one teaching method is more effective than the other. In the experimental research example, a researcher tests whether a relaxation technique reduces stress levels. Stress levels of participants are measured before and after applying the technique. A paired t-test is conducted to compare the pre-test and post-test stress levels. A significant t-test result would indicate that the relaxation technique effectively reduces stress. That's a great summary of the examples. Now let's discuss when to use a t-test over a z-test in their respective assumptions and robustness. Indeed. The choice between a t-test and a z-test depends on factors such as sample size and whether or not population variance is known. The t-test is preferred when dealing with small sample sizes, typically less than 30, and when population variance is unknown. On the other hand, if you have a large sample size, usually 30 or more, and know the population variance, then a z-test may be more appropriate. The z-test assumes that sample means are approximately normally distributed due to the central limit theorem. That's correct. However, it's important to note that both tests have certain assumptions that need to be met for valid results. The t-test assumes that data follows a normal distribution 
and that variances within groups are equal for independent two-sample tests. If these assumptions are violated, there are alternative methods or adjustments that can be employed. Non-parametric alternatives like Wilcoxon signed rank test or Mann-Whitney-U test can be used if normality assumption is violated. If there's violation of homogeneity of variances assumption in independent two-sample tests, Welch's t-test can be considered as an alternative. Transformations like log transformation or square root transformation can sometimes normalize data or stabilize variances, making t-test assumptions more tenable. These are important considerations when applying the t-test in practice. Another consideration is sample size. While the t-test is designed for small sample sizes, extremely small samples, such as those with fewer than five observations, may not provide reliable results. Increasing the sample size can improve the robustness of the t-test. It's also important to consider the effect size in addition to the p-value. The effect size measures the magnitude of the difference between groups. While statistical significance tells us if a difference exists, the effect size helps us understand the practical importance of the results. When conducting multiple t-tests, there is an increased risk of type I error or false positives. To control for this increased risk, researchers should consider using adjustments such as the Bonferroni correction. This correction helps maintain the overall significance level when conducting multiple tests. That's a good point. And it's also worth mentioning that most statistical software packages provide built-in functions to perform t-tests. Packages like R, Python, SciPy, and SPSS have these functions available. It's important to correctly specify the test type, one sample, independent, two sample, or paired, and ensure that assumptions are checked before interpreting the results. Now let's move on to ANOVA, which stands for Analysis of Variance. ANOVA is a statistical technique used to determine whether there are any statistically significant differences between the means of three or more independent groups. While the t-test compares means between two groups, ANOVA is designed to handle multiple groups simultaneously. The primary purpose of ANOVA is to test the null hypothesis that all group means are equal against the alternative hypothesis that at least one group mean differs from the others. ANOVA is widely used in experimental research, where researchers need to assess the impact of different treatments or conditions on a dependent variable. It allows researchers to partition the total variation observed in the data into components attributable to different sources, providing a comprehensive method for understanding how different factors influence the outcome. At the mathematical foundation of ANOVA lies the partitioning of total variance observed in the data into two main components between group variance and within group variance. This partitioning allows researchers to isolate the variability due to differences between group means from the variability within each group. The F statistic is then calculated as the ratio of the between group variance to the within group variance. The F statistic follows an F distribution under the null hypothesis, allowing researchers to determine whether the observed F value is statistically significant. The F distribution is a right skewed distribution that arises when comparing the ratio of two variances. It is used in ANOVA to assess whether the variance between group means is significantly greater than the variance within groups. If the F statistic exceeds the critical value from the F distribution table based on the chosen significance level and degrees of freedom, then we reject the null hypothesis, indicating that there are significant differences between the group means. There are different types of ANOVA as well. One way ANOVA is used when comparing means across multiple groups based on one factor or independent variable. Two-way ANOVA extends this by considering two independent variables simultaneously to assess not only main effects, but also interaction effects between factors. Then there's repeated measures on NOVA, which is used when there are correlated samples, such as measurements taken on the same subjects under different conditions or at different time points. This method accounts for the correlation between measurements and allows for controlling individual differences. ANOVA has real-world applications in various fields. In agriculture, it can be used to compare crop yields across different treatments like fertilizers or irrigation methods. In psychology, it helps compare different therapies or analyze stimuli effects on behavior. In business, it can be used in marketing research to compare customer satisfaction scores across service providers or product versions. In education, ANOVA can be used to compare teaching methods or curricula to improve student performance and inform educational policies. Overall, ANOVA provides a versatile tool for analyzing data with multiple groups and factors. That's correct, and we can see these applications in case studies as well.
For example, in an agricultural case study testing four different fertilizers on crop yield, one way ANOVA reveals a significant S statistic, indicating that not all fertilizers have the same effect on yield. Post hoc tests like Tukey's HSD can then be used to determine which specific fertilizers differ from each other. These case studies show how ANOVA can identify meaningful differences between groups and factors, guiding decision making processes in various practical settings. In the article, it also mentions a psychological case study where a psychologist compares the effects of three different types of therapy on reducing anxiety levels. One way ANOVA was used to analyze the data, and it showed significant differences between the therapies. Further analysis using post hoc tests identified which therapy was the most effective in reducing anxiety levels. So ANOVA can be a valuable tool in the field of psychology as well. It's not just limited to psychology. ANOVA can also be used in business settings. In a business case study mentioned in the article, a company tested three marketing strategies to determine which one was most effective in increasing sales. Two-way ANOVA was used to analyze the impact of marketing strategy and customer demographic, like age group, on sales. The analysis even revealed an interaction effect, suggesting that certain strategies worked better for specific demographics. When ANOVA indicates significant differences between group means, post hoc tests are conducted to determine which specific groups differ from each other. These post hoc tests ensure that researchers can accurately interpret the results of ANOVA and identify which specific group differences are driving the overall significance. Some common post hoc tests mentioned in the article are two keys honest significant difference HSD, Bonferroni correction, and Chef's test. Tukey's HSD compares all possible pairs of group, means and identifies where the significant differences lie while controlling for the family-wise error rate. Bonferroni correction adjusts the significance level for each individual test to account for multiple comparisons. And Chef's test is a more conservative test that is flexible in comparing any combination of group means, not just pairwise comparisons. It's important to note that ANOVA relies on several key assumptions to produce valid results. These assumptions include independence, normality, and homogeneity of variances. Independence means that the observations within each group and between groups should be independent. Normality means that the data within each group should be approximately normally distributed. And homogeneity of variances means that the variances within each group should be equal. When these assumptions are violated, there are strategies that can be employed to deal with them. One strategy is data transformations, such as logarithmic or square root transformations, which can help stabilize variances and normalize data, making the assumptions of ANOVA more tenable. Another strategy is using Levine's test to assess the quality of variances before conducting ANOVA. If significant, it suggests that the homogeneity of variances assumption is violated. If the assumptions of normality and homogeneity of variances cannot be met, non-parametric alternatives like the Kruskal-Wallis test or the Friedman test can be used instead of ANOVA. These tests do not assume normality and are less sensitive to unequal variances. That's correct. And ANOVA can also be extended to handle more complex experimental designs. For example, multivariate ANOVA, M-A-N-O-V-A, is used when there are multiple dependent variables that are potentially correlated. It tests whether the mean vectors of the groups differ across multiple dependent variables simultaneously, providing a more comprehensive analysis of the data. Another extension is analysis of covariance, ANCOVA, which combines ANOVA and regression by adjusting for the effects of one or more covariates that might influence the dependent variable. Finally, the article also discusses power analysis, which is an important concept in hypothesis testing. Power is the probability that a hypothesis test will correctly reject a false null hypothesis, and it influences the likelihood of avoiding a type 2 error. Factors like sample size, effect size, significance level, and variability in the data all affect the power of a test. That's correct. And power analysis involves determining the probability of detecting an effect given specific parameters like effect size and sample size. Researchers can use power analysis to determine the minimum sample size needed to achieve a desired power level given their expected effect size and significance level. 